now moving on, our next um, subject is our water quality highlights section. So um, this is a time that we were wanted to pull together, how are we doing in water quality, right? At a, at a manure nutrient management training, it's great to get an update and we have a variety of different speakers that are going to be touching on that. But to kick us off today, I asked um, Albert DeBoer, um, I'm excited to introduce Albert DeBoer, dairy farmer and chairman of the Portage Bay Shellfish Protection District Advisory Committee. Albert has been dedicated and vocal advocate for water quality protection and the preservation of Whatcom County farming now and for future generations. So please give a hand to welcome Albert DeBoer. Well, thank you very much for that welcome. Uh, and I also would uh, like to thank the Whatcom uh, Conservation District for putting on this event and to uh, Annika and Nicole for the hard work for organizing the event. I think you could agree that they all really know the nutrients. <laughs> I've been asked to uh, introduce the water quality highlights section today because of my position in the Portage Bay Shellfish Water... Uh, six words, it's a little bit too much to say at one time. The Portage Bay Shellfish Advisory District Committee. Uh, I'm Albert DeGore, as she mentioned. Uh, I'm a farmer in Ferndale. My parents moved here from California after immigrating from Holland 60 years ago. Forty years ago, I graduated from college and came here with my new bride and joined the family farm. Uh, I farmed with my dad for about six years, including two years in partnership. And then I uh, purchased my farm in Ferndale, where we are today, and then I'm in partnership with my son. I've been in partnership with him for the last five years. Uh, we are actually working on transition planning so that he can take over the farm. Uh, we know the difficult times that uh, dairies have today. and. Uh, we know how difficult that transition might be. But we are considering that, and water quality and quantity issues are all part of that transition process, and I'm sure you are aware of that. Uh, uh, when, now we'll go back to the Shellfish Committee. The Shellfish Committee was actually uh, formed in 1998 after the Washington Department of uh, Health downgraded portions of the Portage Bay Bay uh, due, due to deteriorating water quality. Uh, the Shellfish Committee actually advises the County Council on proposed actions and operations related to uh, the restoration of the water quality in the Portage Bay Committee. Uh, the goal of the committee, of course, is to keep the shellfish, shellfish beds open, and that's part of the reason why we're all here today, to maintain water quality and get those shellfish beds open. Uh, the members of our Shellfish Committee that we right now have are Fred Lickle, John DeYoung, uh, Dory Bilal, uh, Christine Woodward and Eleanor Hines. Hope I didn't forget anything. Well, and myself. Uh, Erica Douglas, she's the senior uh, water quality planner at Public Works. She is the one that we work with uh, on the Portage Bay District. Uh, there are also about 10 agencies and tribes and cities that participate in our committee, so we typically have 20 to 25 people at our meeting. Uh, those agencies are an important part of our committee. They provide the expertise that we need to do our business. Uh, some of the actions and recommendations that the Shellfish Committee have made in the last uh, several years, including updating the PIC program, the Pollution Identification and Correction Program. I'm sure many of you have seen that. Well, that's part of the work of the Shellfish Committee. Um, we've also proposed that the uh, Portage Bay uh, Watershed District or uh, Drainage Area be declared an MRA, a Marine Recovery Area, and I'll talk about that a little bit a little later. And we propose that we hire a water, auto, uh, water quality data coordinator. Um, May Harris is the result of that, and I'll talk about that in a minute or two. Um, all of these recommendations were actually approved uh, by the County Council, so we're happy with that. Uh, for several years, from 2010 or to 2014 or so, we did not meet regularly as a committee because of well, improved water quality. But since then, we've been meeting four times a year. At the time we started meeting again, they elected me chairman. And we've been uh, very busy uh, trying to do our work improving water quality since then. Uh, I think uh, one of the first things that we talked about when we started meeting was that we need to improve the confidence and trust of the community in the whole process. So the first thing we tackled was uh, the issue of uh, water, quality water quality testing. I heard reports of uh, people taking samples and contaminating the samples. 
So we actually uh, provided education to people on proper water quality sampling protocol and uh, also encourage all the agencies that, in, that uh, work with us on our committee to uh, make sure that they take the samples properly and, and follow the whole process through. We thought that was important for building trust for especially the farmers that are, are uh, affected by all this. Uh, second, we also committed to finding all the sources of, of water, uh, poor water quality. Well, all, everybody always talks about birds, but there's lots of other potential sources. Those sources include uh, cities, wildlife, including birds and raccoons, on-site septic systems, pets, farms, and water coming out of Canada. Some of those sources we had never even thought of uh, five or six years ago when we saw the meetings. Uh, Oh, in connection with the on-site septic systems, I'd like to, you know, I just mentioned the marine recovery area. Uh, what that meant for the on-site septic systems was that every septic system in the, the Portage Bay watershed would be inspected every one to three years. Uh, most of you have probably got letters if you had on-site septic systems uh, signed by the county executive and the county council. The county council and executive were very uh, uh, good at supporting that. So hopefully that's going to help solve some of our uh, quality issues by maintaining our septic systems properly. Uh, educate, oh, uh, the result was that about most of the 30,000 septic systems in the county have been inspected or will be inspected over the next couple of years. Uh, education and training was also supplied for those people who wanted to do their own septic inspections. And uh, if you do your, your own septic inspection, inspection you might want to remember that they do audit that and check and make sure that you actually did the inspection yourself. Uh, next I would like to comment a little bit about our the dairy uh, our, our part in the whole process of maintaining water quality. We're at a critical time right now uh, for improving water quality. Uh, we hope to hear by the end of January whether the spring closure period has whether that's been upgraded that it depends on us to make, make sure that we maintain water quality. And also we're rather disappointed in the November numbers for the fall closure period. So it's critical that we uh, do our job in maintaining water quality. Uh, it's also important to the leaders that we recognized a little while ago. We, uh, they can hardly do their job if they don't have the trust and the confidence of the farmers here that we know that you are doing your job in maintaining water quality. Uh, so, Walking Family Farmers, the Ag Water Board, and the WIDS, they all need to know that you're doing your job, uh, and then, then they can go about their business uh, and uh, know that, that that's happening. Uh, I read recently that if you have a talented quarterback and you don't have a good offensive line, he would never reach his potential. You, know, you guys are the offensive line. We need you to do your job. You know, and as a lineman, everyone has their job. And if somebody misses their, their key block or whatever it is, uh, it's a, not a recipe for success. So I encourage you to do your part. Um, third, we recommended that a water quality data coordinator be hired. That was done. Uh, there are several databases and 800 to 1,000 samples that are taken every month. So it was very difficult to put them all in one area and uh, make them available to all the people that need the information. Uh, and there's also a need to get that information out in a more timely manner. So we, in a more timely manner. So to that end, we hired Meg Harris to do that job. She's here now with us to give us a water quality update. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Thanks, Albert, and thank you for coming today, everyone. Um, today, I have been tasked with giving you an update on where we're at um, with water quality around our county. Um, and I'm gonna focus primarily on um, the Nooksack drainage in Portage Bay today. Um, I know many of you reside and farm in that drainage.
Um, I also want to recognize that a lot of you are, um, some of you are in the Drayton Harbor drainage, um, Birch Bay. So as I go through this and have examples, um, I'll, try to, I'll try to address some of that as well. Um, so when, I, when we're talking about water quality, um, we are talking about um, water quality that's important for um, shellfish growing, as Albert is saying, in Portage Bay, um, recreation, agriculture, irrigation, um, and our animals. And um, all, of we, all of the water in our county, um, we're looking at these and other services that it provides to us. Um, and specifically what we're going to talk about today and what so much of our water quality um, concerns and issues in, in our county are focused on are bacteria. Um, although I want to acknowledge that a lot of work is being done to um, looking at nitrogen and phosphorus and um, I think that more and more work will be done into the future um, with that type of water monitoring too. Um, but today as I talk about water quality a lot of mostly focus on um, bacteria and primarily fecal Coliform. Fecal coliform is a group of bacteria. Um, it's a bacteria, an indicator of pathogens in water. Um, coliform bacteria, they tend to come from the guts of animals, um, humans included, cows included, wildlife included. Um, and they grow really well in guts, but they also grow um, in the environment and in the rivers and, and creeks. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with he at least hearing the term fecal coliform. Um, you also have probably heard of um, E. coli, either in um, water quality topics around here or nationally um, E. coli on romaine lettuce or things like that. Um, most E. coli are part of this coliform group. Um, some of those E. coli are pathogens, so when we think about all of this bacteria, they're all just ways to point us to things in our water that might make us sick. Um, and Washington State has criteria for these bacteria. Um, and I'm just going to give you a few numbers so you can kind of get this into context. Um, I have a lot more information for you if you have more number, more questions about where these numbers actually come from or who sets them. Um, but we have different targets for this bacteria depending on if we're talking about marine waters or, um, or fresh water. So um, in the marine waters, we're looking at for, and we measure this in colonies, um, colonies of bacteria. Um, so 14 and is our average that we're looking for over um, a, a longer period of time. Um, and we, we also have a second part to that criteria that is um, looking at like comparing a single sample to, um, to the number 43. So when we talk about some of these um, values or, or concentrations of bacteria, um, we're looking for something lower than 43 in our marine waters. Um, in the fresh water, it's a little higher. Um, we're looking at these criteria of 100 and 200. Um, and that's because, well, that's um, a few different reasons. Partly, um, that's what's been deemed safe for um, people recreating in, in the river. Um, and we really need to drop that number down lower to be able to eat shellfish safely, which is why the marine criteria is set so much lower. Also, bacteria don't like to live in salt water. If you think about those bacteria living in our guts, they, um, they actually do have a lot of die off in salt water. Um, and finally, I'll just add one more number to this, not to make it too confusing, but um, in, in about 2000, um, there, there was extensive work done on the Nooksack River to set targets so that we could say if we're meeting this target, then we're confident that we're keeping water quality safe for shellfish. And that target is 39. So you'll see some of those numbers as I go through this presentation. You've probably heard some of those numbers before. Okay, so with that, we have programs set up like the Pollution Identification Pick Program to monitor our water quality um, to determine where we're at in, in relationship to these numbers. Um, and we have three different types of programs that I'm going to talk about. Um, and mostly, this, you know, this is a broad range of sampling. Mostly I just want to give you a sense of um, what people might be doing when you see them out on the landscape um, sampling in ditches by you or creeks or the river. So first we have our routine 
or ambient sampling. Um, I have a calendar here because this is pre-scheduled sampling. Um, it tends to happen, it happens once or twice a month um, depending on what watershed it is. Um, and this is primarily the county, um, Whatcom County sampling. So we're looking at sampling the same set of sites, um, a set, ne set, set network um, on, on scheduled dates throughout the year. Um, so we're getting 12 to 24, um, sometimes more samples from um, these sites. Uh, so we can look at trends over a year and over time, over um, five years historically, that kind of thing. When routine or ambient sampling identifies areas where um, we have higher counts, uh, the county has set up what they call uh, focus areas. So that triggers some work to sample more frequently and try to understand what the special conditions there are. Um, and also these focus areas are tied to um, outreach or um, efforts to put activities on the ground. So um, these focus areas get sampled weekly. Um, one, uh, one example of this focus area is the Fish Trap Creek Watershed. Um, there's also some focus area work in the Drayton Watershed. Um, and again, Whatcom County does, does the majority of the sampling, um, but there are some citizen science groups that also do that. So Whatcom Conservation District, we have a stream team that's been working with the city of Linden to sample within the city limits of Fish Trap Creek, and they sample twice a month. The 10 Mile Clean Water Group, that, most, that some of you may know as well, um, does extra sampling in the 10 Mile Watershed um, in conjunction with the county. That's another good example of this focus area work. Okay, and then finally we have our source identification and storm event sampling. Um, and most of this sampling is happening from um, State Department of Agriculture and Washington De Department of Ecology. Um, they have non-point specialists out um, looking at um, areas that may have had high counts from some of the ambient sampling and wanting to dig in a little bit um, more detailed to see why that might be the case. Or um, areas that we know tend to have high counts um, during rain events. So uh, a lot of this sampling is happening throughout the county. Um, in the last few years, we've really tried to focus some storm event work at the border um, because as Albert said, we've, we've recognized um, some of the concerns of high counts coming across the border, especially during, um, during rain events. So that's an example of where um, we really want to understand what's happening there at the border. Um, this, this storm event sampling, um, because it's different and targeted to try to seek out high counts, um, we don't use it when we're talking about, when we're looking at long-term averages, so those that geometric mean, the average, or that 90th percentile statistic. So just know that those statistics are the pre-scheduled random sampling, um, and then we use that storm sampling in addition to that to figure out other high counts. Okay, so I've got another poll question for you. So everyone pull out your phone. Um, and Albert may have alluded to this already. Um, how many water quality samples do you think were collected in Whatcom County in this last year, in 2018, um, by these programs, by the routine sampling and the focus area and the source identification sampling? We have a strong winner there in the over 5,000 category. Um, yes, we um, have we had 5,200 water water samples collected in Whatcom County alone in um, 2018. Um, that is through this PIC program. Um, we also manage I manage water quality data for some of um, Skagit and Snohomish as well, and we're verging on um, 10,000 water samples for all three counties combined. Um, and so that's a lot of water quality samples being taken. Um, this map in the background shows the monitoring sites all around the county. So all, each of those blue dots is a monitoring site. Some of them are sampled on that regular basis and have a long history of sampling. And some of them are more um, 
temporary sites, if you will, for storm events or source identification. Um, all of this information of the water quality sampling, um, where we're sampling, and the, the results can be found online. Um, who's, of a show of hands, who's used the water quality results map? Awesome, great. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, or if you do know what I'm talking about and you can't remember how to get there, um, there's cards on all of the tables that um, describe the map, and there's also some cards um, on the back table if you want to take some home to someone else. Um, this is a great place to bring all of this information, um, you know, view it through your computer or your smartphone. I know it's hard to get down to, um, like go to an agency office and get some of this information. So we're trying as best as we can to bring it to you um, and to your office or your living room. Um, so you can just easily look up what results are on there. So um, you'll, you'll come to a page, you can get to it from the Wacom Conservation District um, webpage um, and you'll come to a map that looks um, sort of like this. And I'm gonna show you some more examples through this presentation, but um, <coughs> Our goal is to allow you to see really easily where we're sampling, how often, and um, who's out there sampling, um, which agency it might be, and then what the results are looking like. Okay, so I've got one more poll for you. And there's no right answer to this, so um, feel free to, yeah. This is, how do you think we're doing in terms of water quality in 2018? Great, I appreciate the confidence. Um, so 60% so of you um, feel that water quality is improving and I'd say you're absolutely right. Um, we have about, we're looking at four out of ambient sites showing um, significant improvements in 2018. Um, the remainder of those sites are um, either staying about the same or having minor declines or worsening in water quality. Um, and this is across that network of, of sites around the county. Um, so we, we are seeing good improvements in, um, in fresh water. I'm going to caveat that a little bit <laughs> later because um, we're still having some challenges, um, especially during rain events and especially in the fall season. Um, but this is a reason to celebrate and um, our successes over the year. So I'm going to give you a couple just examples of this. Um, this is a chart and I, um, that you've seen of um, the ambient water quality in the Nooksack drainage, so um, compared to that geometric mean criteria, so a lot of the a lot of the sites are meeting that criteria. We've got a couple that are getting pretty close to meeting. Um, Scott and Fish Trap um, are working their way down. Unfortunately, when we look at that 90th percentile um, figure, a lot of these sites still aren't meeting. So that's where we're looking at um, intermittent high counts. Um, against that criteria. One thing I'd like to point out um, is that our one achievement for this year is that the 10 mile um, is currently meeting both parts of that criteria um, for the first time. So uh, cheers to people that are in the 10 mile watershed and working hard to keep that clean. Um, and um, I would just say other achievements um, are these sites, um, especially in here where um, the last year's worth of data, so that black dot, is, is lower than that bar, so it's looking a lot better in the last year than it has um, in the past three years. So any of those sites that you see here um, are also achievements. Okay, and what does that mean um, for water quality in Portage Bay? Um, because this is, this is a focus of um, a lot of the work that we're doing in the Nooksack River. So this is the Portage Bay growing area. Um, as you know, it's um, culturally important shellfish growing area, um, and the work to to reopen this area, both for the spring closure um, and ultimately for the fall closure as well, drives a lot of the work that we do. Um, so 
here's a graph of these sites in that closure area over time from 2000 to now. Um, you can see some really um, high counts here, lots of improvements. Um, in, in this period here, we had worsening water quality. That's where Albert was talking about reconvening the shellfish um, portage production district um, and improvements in water quality since about 2014. Um, unfortunately, and I hate to be the, ba the bearer of bad news, but we've had um, a pretty challenging fall um, and we've had some high counts that have brought these numbers back up. Um, a couple sites in specific are precariously close to that value of 43 that we're trying to avoid. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of those. Um, but this is some reason for concern and um, it's, it's Department of Health is going to take this into account as they're thinking about reopening that spring closure period. Um, so this is disheartening, um, but I think it's there are specific things that we can do to address this and, and have that turn around a bit. Okay, so as I've said a few times, fall is a critical time for water quality, especially in Whatcom County and Western Washington as a whole. We get a lot of rain, as you know. Um, so we're talking about rain on areas that have had um, applications in the spring and early fall, rain on areas where animals have been out or are still out. These are photos from this last fall. And rain in areas um, around roads and urban areas um, and just a lot of water on the ground. Um, this is the rainfall from this fall and I'm going to focus on three events and just um, give you a, an example of what's been happening. So um, we had a big rain event like right around Halloween, um, over two and a half inches in 72 hours. You guys probably remember that one. <laughs> yeah. um, we had a rain event December 10th um, that was less rain, uh, about an inch and a quarter, um, but it was after a period of about a week of dry. And then we had another big rain event just recently um, at the new year, about two and a half inches of rain um, in 72 hours again. Um, and I, I'm pointing these out because I want to give you a couple of examples of what water quality looks like around these rain events. Okay, so this is that Halloween storm. Um, and this is a screenshot of that water quality map that we've been talking about. So um, many high counts, um, especially counts over 5,000, um, which is pretty high for this area, um, kind of dispersed through the county and, and high counts in um, the main Nooksack River of 100. So remember, we're looking at trying to get this number of 100 down to about 39. <coughs> This December 10th event was a little bit different. Um, we have sampling across the border and at the border that showed very high counts coming from um, BC and running their way down the, oh, down the Fish Trap Creek. Um, we had low counts in a lot of the north-south ditches, like especially in the um, North Linden Wid and areas that we've really focused some work. Um, and so that's really great to be seeing low um, water quality on our side of the border, even if we're getting um, big pulses down through Canada. Um, sometimes it's challenging to break those apart. And so in this example, um, we can see that moving through. Um, and finally, I'll um, give you this last example of January 2nd. So um, in this example, we had some high counts, um, especially in Scott, Cougar, and 10 Mile. Um, in these watersheds, there were some first flush events that didn't happen this fall that took till January to, to occur. Um, and I think all three of these um, fall rain events, um, Michael Eisensee with WSDA is going to give you some more photos and, and um, discuss these in a, in a little bit. Um, but as you can see, all of these are um, you know periods where we have precipitation, um, bacteria in our waterway from different sources, um, some of which were um, dairy or non-dairy livestock, others um, were not. Okay, so with all of this information, we still have, um, we still have a lot of questions, um, as you do too probably. So um, questions like what is the Canadian influence? What's the contribution of septic systems? Can we measure this bacteria in real time and not need people going out on the landscape taking bottles of water and driving them to the laboratory? How long does it take for bacteria like this to move through a system? 
What's the contribution of wildlife, birds, raccoons? Are there other sources that we haven't even thought of yet? Um, how long does that bacteria stay in Portage Bay? And what's the urban contribution um, from areas like Linden and Ferndale? So the good thing is we have a lot of questions, but we also have a lot of tools. Um, and so I want to just give you some examples of what those tools are um, that we can put into our monitoring toolkit as we're moving forward. Um, and I hope to come every year to this with um, more information about what these tools have answered for us in terms of what these sources might be. So um, tools like border sampling, um, we've started partnering with, um, with water quality partners in British Columbia, and now we're sampling um, at specific sites along the border, and they are as well. They've brought in some of their work in BC and doing some compliance work as well. Um, so that's a really powerful tool of collaboration that we're um, working with them. In terms of the septic contribution, um, the PIC program has added um, some work with a fluorometer device. So we're looking for um, chemicals in the water that are indicators of septic. Um, optical brighteners that we use in our laundry detergent end up in our septic systems too, and we can, we can look for those um, with this instrument. Um, and so we'll have one now in the county to do that as well. Um, instruments like the ZAPS, which I think you've heard of, and Nicole's gonna talk about a little bit, um, is a real-time device that we're testing out um, in Whatcom County to see if it can answer some questions about um, bacteria in real time and how long it takes for some of these plugs to come through. Um, in the wildlife component, we've um, introduced a wildlife tracker app, which Nicole's gonna talk about as well, and there's also some business cards on the table for you to see. What are these sources? Um, you, we have a project going right now looking at environmental DNA in these samples and can we use that DNA to piece apart um, what's human, um, what's wildlife, what, what is livestock. How long does bacteria stay in Portage Bay? Um, some modelers and researchers at, at Western Washington University are working on some modeling work of Portage Bay to see how currents are moving and how the Nooksack really does influence that area. And what's the urban contribution? And we work really directly with um, the city of Linden and, um, and now more with the city of Ferndale trying to um, look at um, outfalls and when we get high counts with the stream team in, um, in the city of Linden, um, we have folks from the city going out and really following up um, very immediately on on some of those concerns. So that's been a really great partnership as well. And finally, I just want to close by saying thank you. Thank you for all the work that you have been doing um, to improve water quality in our county um, and to see some of these um, reductions in bacteria at these sites all across the county um, and in Portage Bay as well. And I hope that you um, continue to do that work um, and we'll work with other partners in different sectors um, to address some of those other, um, you know, septic concerns, non-dairy livestock, that kind of thing. Um, but keep it up and we'll continue to see improvements and hopefully see a swing back around in that um, marine water quality as well. You can take a question. Maybe. Yeah, Jeff. What, what do you guys figure your lab costs on deep water sample is? That's a good question. So um, to test for fecal coliform is about $20. Um, when you add E. coli, it jumps up to 30, 35. Um, so times uh, five to 10,000 is a lot of money. <laughs> but um, it's also approachable. It means that um, if there's a specific area that we're interested in, you know, a couple of samples, um, you, could, you know, you could get a good sense of a site within $100. Um, when we're talking about that DNA work, uh, that price jumps up pretty significantly into the couple hundred dollar range. Is that just the cost of processing the sample, or is that including the cost of actually taking the sample too? That would be the laboratory cost. Um, the sample, yeah, taking the sample cost would be staff time, so I guess you could divide that out. Um, a lot of these days, you have one agency staff taking about like 25 to 30 samples, so if you thought about 
um, someone's time paid by the hour, you could do the math. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm is uh, all the sampling being done in one lab, or is there like exact and what's the other one, Ovid, Ovid said, and yeah, does the question. state do their own, yeah, so, or is it all through one? Yeah, so um, there are a couple different laboratories we use. There's two in Whatcom County now, um, Edge Laboratories and Exact. Um, there was a third for a while. Um, both of those labs are used um, by, by the programs here. Um, they're both accredited um, and certified for these um, laboratory analyses, and we've done quite a bit of work um, with comparing the results both um, between agencies, so ensuring that like field staff are collecting consistently, and between labs, um, and we have some pre we have good confidence that the labs um, are giving us the same results, so we consider them, you know, one to one. But they do have to go through process of like um, recertifying every year, making sure that they meet criteria. They get like um, blind samples that they need a test and have it in a certain range. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be 39 um, at, well, really anywhere on the lower Nooksack River, so from about Ferndale down to um, Bellingham Bay. Um, Ferndale, there's two sites that we consider the lowest sites on the river, um, one at Ferndale and one at Marine Drive, and the goal would be for both of those sites to be lower than 39, and they currently are. Great, thank you guys. And as always, if you have other questions, come find me during the event or um, my email address is on some of these business cards floating around. <laughs> All right, thanks, May. Um, so we're gonna start off with um, another polling question for you. Um, which of these sources that's up here do you think is the biggest threat to water quality in your watershed? You can just pick one. Just a curiosity here. So there's human, non-dairy livestock, wildlife, dairy manure, waterfowl, birds, that can be barn birds too, uh, pets or Canadian sources, knowing there's a lot more, but this is just to uh, get your brain warmed up. All right, there's a variety of responses here. Some of them are much higher than others. Um, interesting, after the presentation we heard too, the human is pretty high there. That would be like a septic component or otherwise. Um, so the, the answer to it, it's interesting to see you guys respond to this question knowing that it could be any or all of these, right? Um, as we've just heard. And the other kind of part of that too is that if you just heard there's doing E. coli or fecal coliform testing, but we don't actually quite know which of these is it, right? Some of it is guessing. Some of it is trying to bracket and do a specific point, but it's not easy. And so we've got a new project that's underway currently for actually developing a catalog, a fecal source catalog that then can be used that when we get a water sample, we can determine the bacterial DNA in that water sample that matches up with a specific source. So this is a pretty cool project. Uh, with exact scientific, uh, practical informatics in the Whatcom Clean Water Program and all its different uh, supporters and partners in the Whatcom Conservation District. So the Whatcom Conservation District gets the pretty glamorous job of going out and getting all those fecal source samples. Uh, the lab gets the second most glamorous job of actually analyzing them. And practical informatics is the one actually doing this whole big signature of what a bacterial source looks like. So you can think about for each of the things we look at, it's like creating a, a unique fingerprint so that when we get a water sample, we can look in there and say, we see a human fingerprint, we see a beaver fingerprint, we see starling and so on. And so what we're, um, the goal is to number one, develop that catalog. You guys might've been aware last year or two conversation about one of these kind of microbial source tracking projects that happened here in Whatcom County where um, the Lummi tribe was assisting DN or assisting uh, EPA in collecting samples and those were really all they could really see was human, avian, dog, ruminant 
it wasn't very specific of what was inside of there. And if you remember, those results are pretty variable. They weren't very accurate. It just didn't yield very useful or definitive information for us. And neither was that method so accurate that if none of those were detected in water, did we have the confidence to say they weren't in the water, right? So if you get a sample that comes back human, you should be, have confidence that just human was in there and ruminant was not. But the way that that type of analysis was done, we weren't that confident. We could say, oh, we saw a human, but maybe there was still ruminant, we're not sure, right? There's too much air in that. We're testing a very different method now that's much more specific. It's looking far, far deeper into how do you look at a bacterial signature of any one species via the microbes in their gut. So we're not looking at like you, your blood DNA. We're not looking at the species DNA. We're looking at what's in their gut, therefore what's in the feces that comes out of that animal. And that's pretty important that we can um, start to develop that. But also know that the method we're doing is still pretty new. So we're also exploring what are the limits? Can we actually distinguish the difference between a dairy cow and a beef cow versus a deer? All three of those are ruminants, but we're really hoping we can actually figure out a signature that looks at each one rather than grouping them. Because again, grouping them isn't very helpful when those three are very significantly different sources. And we, again, have to make assumptions if we just say a ruminant versus a beef cow or a dairy cow or a deer or a sheep or a goat or so on. So we're really hoping that that's going to help us. And with our primary goal in the end of that, not to point fingers and implicate, but rather for us to have a good understanding of what are the sources in the water in different watersheds, different times of the year, so we can go backwards and then help those specific sources with better education, with better conservation practice implementation and so on. So that really is the goal is just for those individuals to know that they're an issue. In many cases that is the problem in certain watersheds that we point the finger at what seems to be an obvious source but it can be something completely different that that individual or that source doesn't actually know it. So some of these things are extremely helpful in just that, just increasing knowledge, increasing understanding so we can help with better education and outreach to those individuals, or to even know, yes, it is that big obvious source we thought it was, and we just need to do more in that source. So it, it's very helpful to stop finger pointing and rather take the responsibility for um, that source or what's happening out there instead of blaming others. I think it's, a, it's our most critical pathway towards a very good and permanent lasting a water quality improvement in a source um, way. So these are all of those different fecal sources that we are collecting in an effort to create those individual signatures. And you can see it's a lot. Human, sheep, goat, horse, dairy, beef, pig, dog, raccoon, beaver, deer, starling, goose, swan, seagull, duck. And there's a few more we're hopeful. And a few we've got, oh boy, there's a champion, super duper pooper scooper in our office, Jeff Littlejohn, who has collected more fecal samples than you can imagine. And he's even collected some that were not on our list, like bear. That was a pretty brave one uh, to collect, if you can imagine. So we've got all sorts of, um, all kinds of fecal samples. And what I really do want to say about that is thank you to any of you in the room who have already helped us with contributing to a source, allowing us on your property to collect a source, whether that be of a livestock or um, one of these wildlife sources. It's really, really important when we collect these that we just don't get a farm or one animal, but our goal is to actually get um, many animals from many farms because we mix all those together. We're not trying to create an individual farm signature. That is not our goal. What we do is we'll go to five different beef operations and collect uh, manure from three or four different animals from all those and then we mix it all together and the point there is you can probably think about the diet at each one of those facilities is going to be slightly different and that changes the bacteria in their gut and what we want to do is be able to mix all those together so that when we get a sample from any one waterway it's going to have 
kind of a composite signature of bee for a raccoon or so on. So hence, if you've been part of this project with us and maybe you're a little nervous that we are creating, you know, your farm signature, we're not. We have no interest in doing that. What we're trying to do is mix all those together. So the more samples we can get from more farms, just the better that signature, the more accurate that fingerprint we're going to create is going to be. So it's very helpful and we appreciate all landowners who have really assisted us with that. So a little game. Can you guess that poo pile? So in your brain, feel free. There's, um, we've got nine different poo piles up there. Don't worry, this isn't a survey or anything else. You can strictly do this in your brain. See if you can like, oh yeah, I've seen that one before. I know what that one is. All right, so what do we have up here just for fun? We've got pig poo. I hope anyone got that. This is swan and goose. You can see the size difference next to the two. Swans are really big, it turns out. We've got raccoon poo, sheep, bees, seagull. I hope that one was pretty obvious. Bear, that's the bear poo. I, I'm pretty impressed we got that one. Duck poo, um, goat poo. So that was kind of in your brain if you had gotten any of those. Some of like the goat, goat, sheep, slightly different. We're learning a lot about what these different poops look like. In fact, we have a new title for this is professional scatologists in our um, group. So whoever knows how to identify scat. So how can you help us? One of the hardest parts about this is, yes, we know where livestock are. If we wanted to drive around and look out the window, or we know where the dairies are and where your fields are applied, but tracking wildlife is really hard, but also extremely important. Let's say there's a high count in a watershed and it's December. No one's putting manure out there. All the animals are inside for the winter. Your septic maybe is, is running the same. What could it be? Maybe you as a landowner or a farmer in that area say there are 2,000 swans sitting in that ditch right now. Or there's been this beaver dam and it's, you know, there's four or five beaver in there, so on and so forth. By you helping us by tracking those things, just putting them in an app with a photo or just the location and the time of year, we can start to get a better idea of wildlife kind of their patterns, especially uh, waterfowl, what are their migratory timelines, when are they in watersheds? That may explain, help us start to explain those high counts, those bursts of high count. And or for us in the wildlife tracker, when we are like, wow, we really, we need to get a beaver sample, where are those little suckers? We can look on the map and say, oh look, here are three different sites, give that land owner a call, hi, can we come get a beaver sample off your property? Greatly appreciate it. So, this is a really fun way, and it's very easy. There's a little card on uh, the tables and more at our information booth about how to access this little, I apologize, we couldn't make it any easier of a website, but once you're in there, um, what it looks like is, you'll see a screen like this. It's pretty easy, you can just click this button, it puts where your location is, and there's just a couple questions. What date did you see it? How many, of, what species was it and how many? That's it. So it's totally anonymous data goes in there. And uh, when you're driving around the county, you can log it if it's on your own property, deer, um, uh, et cetera. And so you can see, I realize these points are small, but here's all of the different wildlife sightings that have been logged into here. You can see it's a lot, it's all over the county. It's pretty cool to see this stuff come in. And a lot of these are and have been recently in that like goose and swan and duck. So a lot of that migratory waterfowl, it's pretty great. But deer as well. It's neat to see the, the patterns where deer are um, in our county. Where elk and pigeon and coyote, duck, beaver, deer, um, a lot of the wildlife and then other. So again, if you see a bear or a mountain lion and want to log it, please do so. So it gives you the opportunity to make comments in there. So this is a pretty cool way that you can help us to start to track this wildlife component of the water quality picture that is not a stationary or a seasonal thing per se. So some of these, again, are transient, some live around. Um, and with that, does anyone have any questions about this project or that wildlife tracker that I can answer? So, uh, yeah, right here. So once you notice, like see if there's 2,000 swans in the field, you go out 
you try to get the swans out of there, or you can just chop it up to that piece of nature? You have now asked a superb question. Thank you. So, right, what? let's say waterfowl ends up being a very high source of fecal coliform in a watershed or a waterway. We can't find them. We can't really kick them out. It is possible that you could do a natural mediation of those. So why are the swans come? <coughs> Did you have a field that was in corn before and now they're there to get that corn. Maybe that becomes a grass field if we're worried about it. Or can you do a, a predator, a, like a bird of prey predator program in that field? So the point being that in some cases we have to accept a certain level of water quality degradation if it's wildlife. And that is a question that should go with Meg's all those other questions on that wheel that we haven't answered yet. Part of something like this is for us to start gathering information to give to those decision makers or the people who create policy to answer exactly the question you just asked. Fine, now we figure out waterfowl or wildlife, how are we supposed to deal with that? How does the regulatory faction want to address that appropriately, knowing there's maybe little they can do about it? So, it's a great one. I guess the second reason why I ask that question is I'm scattered. And we have a couple of fields that get, you know, 25,000 birds yeah. throughout the whole winter. Well, what we'll do before we plant manure in the spring, we actually take a sample ourselves and send it in and get it tested because what happens in the past uh -huh. is yeah. we finally go out to apply manure mm -hmm. in the spring and then the test in the ditch comes back positive. We'll finish getting the birds out there all winter. We're not supposed to do it. Yeah. We actually almost got fined, but then we finally sent in that water sample that we took out of our own pocket. Yeah. Well, I will say that was, you guys did absolutely the right thing. So in many cases, what we tell farmers is if that they do have a high bird or otherwise population and they are worried about a high count, your best course of action is to take water samples to have in your pocket if the high of a count comes back high and they try to put it back on you. So you guys like actually did it. <laughs> Fair enough. Or you're trying to say, hey, you know, this is sampling. Or you can contact your local program and say, hi, I'm worried about a high count. Will you come take a sample and see what it is with waterfowl before I put my manure out because I don't want to get implicated for a high count. So you can contact, and Skagit is different than Whatcom, but similar people working on those programs across counties. So more often, instead of you maybe having to front the cost, you can call your local water quality group and say, I'm worried about this. I want you to come take a sample for me. And most likely they will or work with you on that. So it is your best course of action. Yeah. Uh, and there's a question over here. Yeah. Yeah, suppose I apply a manure on the field and the seagull is in. The seagull flies over a ditch and someone's pooping up in the ditch. Obviously, the agent will show the seagull. Will they transfer the, the bow line? Could you repeat that question? That's a great question. So, um, and, and I'll, I'll do this generally because I think this happens. So he's asking, let's say a bird or your dog eats cow manure or ingests that when they're on your field or running around the farm. And then, you know, that does that DNA from the poop that they eat from a different source transfer into their own? We don't know yet. That is something that we are exploring in this project. We think not that, that, that their own microbes and bacteria in their stomach are gonna definitely override those other sources, but it is actually something we are exploring in this program to answer that because I've had that question asked a lot, you know, and, and it's a very important question for us to know that is their transfer of you know, this bacterial DNA if, if another source ingests it and then it goes out so that, you know, a few seagulls is probably not going to be a significant kind of bacteria raiser, but it's important for us to know that. So will it come up as one signal when it's been contributed by something else? Yeah, great question. So I'm going to transfer to our next speaker, but I will say if you have any more of these questions, Please talk to me afterwards, mostly because sometimes you guys have questions maybe our project hasn't thought about, and you give us a great way to think about the data, reinterpret it, or hopefully this time next year. This project should be ending in about July time frame, and so we'll have a full project report out to you, or maybe we're even taking some great water quality samples and getting these answers to our next event next year. But um, please come talk to me anytime about that project. <coughs>
And you, Matt. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Yes. Keeping things moving. How's everybody doing? Take a big stretch. Arms up in the air. Oh, yeah. It's actually really cold in here, I think. But we're working on that. Um, so uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about what Whatcom Conservation District and others are doing about water quality in those other sectors that we just mentioned. Um, so I'm calling this water quality protection beyond the dairy. Um, and it's a lot of what Nicole just mentioned. So um, I'll be showing some of the um, educational and marketing tools that we've been using to promote best management practices and behaviors for some of those other sectors that we talked about. Um, so again, Whatcom Conservation District, our mission is to assist landowners with their conservation choices. We've been doing it since 1946, and that means a lot of things. Yes, we have a large nutrient management program within the district, but even larger is our education and outreach program that has primarily been focused uh, most recently <coughs> on non-dairy livestock um, potential pollution sources. So we'll be talking about that as well. Your dog, your duty. Um, pet waste is, is a big issue in Whatcom County. Uh, the last census came up with about 48,000 dogs in Whatcom County. Um, and each of those can produce up to a pound of waste uh, every year. And so there's uh, lots of different promotional campaigns, specifically in the city of Bellingham has been doing probably the most. And then this last year, city of Linden really got on board. You may have noticed these signs that popped up along the Jim Kenwick Trail, right along um, from the Linden City Park up to Bender Fields. There had previously been no information about actually picking up dog waste. Everything that it said there was simply leash up your dog. Um, so we installed these signs in cooperation with the Linden Christian Schools. So we got some students out there to, to dig those signposts in. It was a really fun project. And we have about 13 new signs and six new um, bag dispensers along that trail. Um, and then we've seen, we did an evaluation of the amount of dog waste we saw on the ground, season to season, year to year, and we saw a significant increase in the amount of pet waste that was being picked up. So not left on the ground and picked up and not only put in a bag, but also put in the trash, which seems like to be such a barrier for folks. So we're trying to make that a, a more accessible tool. Keeping wildlife wild. Um, there's, we have social media memes, we have stickers and a new rascally raccoon game that we've been promoting at some uh, family events that focus really on deterring wildlife in your own backyard to allow them to not be habituated to human food primarily. Um, so a lot of the outreach materials talk about um, containing your pet food if you leave it outside because that really attracts raccoons, possums, etc. And ensuring your trash and compost can't be um, easily accessible to those animals as well. Giving them an unnatural food source keeps those types of animals around. And raccoons are known to defecate in latrines in um, watered areas, so in and around streams. So this is a really important tool and if you hear people feeding raccoons, please mention that they have uh, bacteria associated with their poop and you would prefer them to not feed those raccoons, even though they do seem cute, but I don't think they're very cute. They're kind of gross. Okay, hump it, don't dump it. Um, our, in 2018, the Puget Sound became a no discharge zone, which was sort of a no brainer to most of us. Um, but now it's enforced that you cannot discharge the sewage out of your build tank and your boat. Um, and then Drayton Harbor and Squalicum Harbor have now purchased and installed um, mobile pump out stations for marine users. So you don't have to pull up to an area to, to pump out that tank, but you actually, there's a mobile unit that can be kind of taken down the dock and directly to your slip, um, which is a huge improvement um, or in and around those marinas. Septic systems. You're going to hopefully start seeing a lot more um, billboards and flyers, uh, hopefully postcards as well, and a lot of social media around um, septic system evaluation and inspections. So there's about 30,000 septic systems in Whatcom County, which is a whole heck of a lot. And a lot of them might be getting to the point where um, their use is questionable. 
So Portage Bay, Drayton Harbor, and most coastal watersheds have now been designated a marine recovery area, and Albert DeBoer talked about that briefly. And what that means is now it is required that those systems are in compliance. So that means that every one to three years, depending on your system, that you would have to get an inspection or evaluation that is registered with the um, Whatcom County Health Department. And um, I just got this stat in that last year, We've, we've had um, a great amount of improvement in outreach and education around septic systems. And just last year, we had almost 4,000 septic systems brought into compliance um, of those, of those 30,000. So that, mean, that doesn't mean that the rest of them are not in compliance. Um, but that is, that's a huge amount that every year, or if we get that amount every year, that means that most of our systems are going to be in compliance. And what's really great about this system that Whatcom County has set up now, we were able to um, sort of negotiate and get some grant funding for rebates for homeowners. So um, if you attend a homeowner education course um, to do it yourself, you can do your own septic inspections if that's something that people are into, and, and or qualify for a $200 rebate for an inspection or pumping. And last year, there were 50 of those septic rebates given out. And there's also low interest loans through Craft 3 for folks that really need some big maintenance, big repairs, or complete replacements of their septic systems. We have loans for people to do that now, too. So incentivizing and just getting rid of some of those barriers that um, are we're preventing folks from getting their system evaluated. So um, I guess said, a lot of our education and outreach has been focused on um, our non-dairy livestock producers. Um, and so these are just, this is our infographic on what are some of the common best management practices that when our farm planners go out and talk to folks, they're really starting to encourage some of these practices similar to what folks are doing on, on your farms. <clears throat> and how we get people to invite us out to do some of these farm planning services or provide technical assistance is we have um, our farm speaker series, which we're doing every month of the year, the third Thursday, we have one tonight, that specifically is a poultry workshop. Um, but we've been, we do, yeah, 12 events a year and over 300 participants, unique participants in those events. And we're making them really livestock um, specific. So a goat workshop, a poultry workshop, we're, we're doing one on sheep, um, we had one on llamas, so really being specific for the livestock type. And then folks get to know us, and it's been a really successful program in providing education and then one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. Save the date for March 9th. This is one of our biggest events of the year. We had about 350 people show up at last year's Small Farm Expo. This will be our fourth annual event. It's right here at the Expo building, Northwest Washington Fairgrounds. We have about 45 different agricultural exhibitors and then talks on every half hour. Um, and then a keynote speaker in the middle of the day. And this has been a really great way for folks to meet us and meet other um, technical service providers in a really comfortable environment and, and breaking down any of the barriers they have in, in meeting us. Um, so yeah, save the date for that one. We offer, again, free technical assistance and farm planning services. If you have a neighbor who has horses, if you have a neighbor who um, has some goats or sheep, let them know that we, are, we offer free confidential services, we offer tarps for manure piles and soil testing for, for pasture health, and those are all free services that we provide. And just in this last year, we offered cost share for these types of best management practices, so manure storage and access lanes, exclusion fencing, heavy use areas, and this cost share are um, basically a grant that's given to, similar to EQIP and some of the other programs that we'll be talking about momentarily, um, but giving a certain <coughs> amount of funding to an individual to put in these best management practices, but they're also having to put in 30% um, of the cost as well. But we found um, that that's been a great incentive for, for folks to get like a good manure storage in or to really have a great sacrifice area um, involved. And then just new this year, we've been offering a $200 rebate for folks to put in some heavy use area footing or gutters or downspouts on their barns. And um, just, we, so we just rolled it out at the end of last year. And we already had um, a 
a dozen folks that have signed up for this sort of rebate. So these are all um, tools that we use to, to get um, folks to meet us and invite us out on their farm and provide te technical assistance. And it's been working. Um, so these are sort of the results. The timeline is the, the bottom is obviously the years and then participants reached on that other axis. And this is just folks who've come into our office for voluntarily for farm planning uh, assistance. And you can see in 2013 and 14, we had about two to four people come into our office <laughs> looking for assistance from us. And now with these tools that we've provided, some of the incentives, the, um, the educational events, they're meeting us, we're getting up um, almost 100 folks to come into our office, non-dairy livestock folks that are interested in our services. And these are just the voluntary ones that are coming in. So I think that's a pretty impressive number. Um, the other program that I'd like to talk about today, and you all have a flyer on your um, table as well, is our Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. And I know Walking Family Farmers have been talking a lot about how, how much farmers are doing as far as creating buffers and um, protecting riparian habitat for salmon improvement. This is a program that we provide through the Conservation District. Um, please talk to me more about it at our booth, at, maybe at lunch or after this event. Um, but just this year in riparian restoration improvements, we've put in about six and a half miles of riparian buffer. It's about 49 acres of, of these blue tubes out in the county on um, rural and agricultural land. And the other thing I really want to talk about, too, that we're pretty proud of, and uh, Frank Corey in our office is the mastermind behind this, is we've um, been really working on these uh, fish barriers. So um, if there's a culvert that's really degraded, if there's a head cut and they're just not able to, to go up that distance or it's undersized, there's a lot of problems with that, that even if we improve habitat upstream, they just can't access it. And so just in this last year, um, we replaced 16 barriers um, and opened up, uh, what do I have, 12 point, almost 13 miles of habitat that hadn't previously been opened up. So it's a pretty impressive number um, and we're, we're proud of the work that our office has been doing in fish passage removal. And that's all I have in water quality protection beyond the dairy. Um, so there, does anybody have any questions about those programs? Or, uh, and or, ooh, I just attached it, it's there. Awesome. So I want to talk about another award that was giving out, switching gears, we're transitioning. Um, another award that was given out just this year, and it was a nomination by the Whatcom Conservation District, uh, was awarded to, to Western Waves Dairy in December of 2018. Uh, Western Waves is awarded the Drayton Harbor Watershed Steward Award um, for their commitment to on-farm stewardship and contribution to nutrient management research in Whatcom County. Over the past seven years, Western Waves made a personal investment in advanced nutrient management systems and water quality protection practices, including manure storage improvements, waste treatment, and conservation covers. Additionally, Western Waves has been enthusiastic and leading partner in our Discovery Farms program, led by Nicole Embertson. It's a farmer-led research program focusing on conservation practice effectiveness monitoring and improvements. And the cumulative contributions made by Western Waves to water quality <coughs> protection has gone a long way towards improving Drayton Harbor watershed, and we greatly appreciate all the efforts that they put in. And here is uh, owner Bill Wagren and Kevin Doherty accepting the award in, at the Drayton Harbor celebration this year. And um, I'd love to bring Kevin up, and I have, a, I have another t-shirt for you. <laughs> so let's give a big hand to Western Waves. Okay, he's good. But you get to pick the raffle prize. <laughs> All right, get out your tickets. Get out your tickets, everyone. And this prize, we wait and figure out. Let's see what we're going to do. We have. Oh, this is awesome. Okay, you get a Whatcom Conservation District hat, very styly. Um, it is blue with white letters, and a gift certificate to hardware sales for $25. So, 
which is was generously donated. All right, Kevin, you get to choose. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> okay, the last three numbers are seven, eight, three. Seven, eight, three. You have to be present to win. <laughs> 783, 783, no one? Oh, there he is in the back, awesome. And let's give a big hand to Kevin and Mr. Thank you.